So now I'm going to begin lecture 37 and this lecture is about quadratic programming and I am Dr. Ranjan Ganguly. Now essentially quadratic programming is an extension of linear programming and here we have a quadratic cost function and linear constraints. So recall that in linear programming we had linear cost functions and linear constraints and here the change is essentially in the cost function. Now we know from our previous studies that quadratic approximations are better than linear ones for nonlinear optimization problems. And therefore QP is widely used at some stage in many constrained optimization problems. For example, we are going to discuss the constraint steepest descent method later and that will use QP as a subproblem. So essentially you convert your nonlinear optimization problem into a QP subproblem and solve it at different points during the process. So you solve it at each K where K is going from 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on. So we can define the QP problem as follows. You minimize this function F bar which is ctd plus half dtd. And this is a form where essentially the H matrix is a unit matrix and therefore you have a positive definite H matrix here. And you minimize this function subject to constraints which are given here. So again, you have the typical set of equality constraints and then you have the set of less than type of constraints. So again, remember some of these particular nomenclature, you have C is the gradient, you have D, which was the search direction, and you have the matrix N here, and the matrix A here, which contain the coefficient of these two constraints, and the right-hand side are given by E and B respectively. Now, when we think about this QP and compare it to the linear program, we see that basically the cost function has changed for the QP. We see that the QP retains its convexity as given in the form in the previous slide because both the cost function and the constraint remain convex. The solution to the QP problem is unique because all these functions involved are complex or rather convex functions. Now we can generalize the QP if we use the design variables X, which are typically used in a problem. And here then you would get the usual form that you have a quadratic function here, which we call Q of X. And so the first term would involve the gradient vector. So CTX where C is the gradient. The second term involves the Hessian matrix H here. Now, of course, if there is any constant that doesn't really play any part in the minimization process, so we don't need to carry any constant here. Now, this particular function is to be minimized subject to these two constraints here. Again, the information about these constraints is captured in the matrices A and N and in the vectors B and E, and the design variable should be greater than or equal to zero. Now we can immediately use some of our past knowledge of optimization here. We clearly see that if H is positive semi-definite, then the QP would be convex. If H is positive definite, then the QP is strictly convex. Now for most realistic problems, H is at least positive semi-definite and therefore many applications do satisfy this particular requirement. Because in general, if you have a well-posed minimization problem, then you should reduce the function, the cost function as you progress. And therefore you are likely to have a positive semi-definite H matrix at that given point. So now one of the ways in which you can solve this QP problem is by using the KKT conditions and we will show that we use the simplex method to essentially solve this QP problem. So again, recall that you have one of the constraint equations in this form 
ATX is less than B. And therefore, we can add a slack variable here given by S to turn this into an equality constraint. And here all the S values are greater than or equal to zero. Simultaneously, there is one more constraint on the problem, which is that the XI should be greater than or equal to zero, which is essentially same as negative of XI is less than or equal to zero. So we will treat that as a constraint also. So now we form the Lagrange function corresponding to this problem. So you have the quadratic function here, which is CTX plus half XTHX. You have the equality constraint here, which I have taken from here, that is ATX plus S minus B. And this is pre-multiplied by U transpose, where U are the Lagrange multipliers for this problem, for this constraint. You also have the second constraint of the form NTX and therefore here you get this here and then the Lagrange multiplier for this is corresponding V. So again these are the equality constraints, these are the inequality constraints which have been converted to equality constraints by using slag variables and these are the constraints here of the form XI greater than or equal to zero so negative of x has been directly included here and the um, psi value here that is the Greek letter xi is essentially the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to these constraints xi greater than or equal to zero. So we have three Lagrange multipliers here u, xi and v. So u, v and xi are vectors containing the Lagrange multipliers. Now to get the KKT conditions, we need to differentiate this Lagrangian with respect to X. That gives us one of the equations here in terms of C, H, A, N. And also, if we differentiate the Lagrange multipliers with respect to U, with respect to V, with respect to Xi and so on, you get all these different equations. So again, it throws back your constraints at you here you have the switching conditions for the different problems and you have the fact that the slack variable is greater than or equal to zero and the Lagrange multiplier of the form U is greater than or equal to zero. But of course the Lagrange multiplier V is free in sign. So because the Lagrange multiplier for equality constraints is free in sign, we split it into two variable so we define v is y minus z or y minus z and then we keep in mind that both these numbers can be greater than or equal to zero so this is the form which we had used in the lp parts of the course and if you remember we can express a free variable as a difference of two positive variables so now we can write all those equations in a matrix form so if you recall the first equation, it was the H matrix into X plus A matrix into U minus Xi plus NY minus NZ. So similarly, the second matrix, second equation was ATX. Then there was a plus S term, and then this is going to be equal to B. And the third equation was n transpose into x and then no other term and then this is going to be equal to e. So essentially the constraints have been captured here and these the first equation represents the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x and the second two equations represent the two major constraints in the problem which capture the coefficient matrices a and n respectively. And these are the different variables which we now need to determine. Again, this particular vector is known based on the problem formulation. Now, this particular matrix can be written in a more compact form. So essentially, you recall there was a matrix, there was a vector, and there was a vector. And we have used these matrices i and 0 to essentially write this equation in a matrix form. And typically, instead of carrying this entire huge equation, what is done is that this form Bx equal to D is used, 
where you remember the fact that B is the matrix, X and D are vectors. And so the solution of this matrix equation needs to be obtained. So now let me write down the entire QP problem as expressed in terms of KKT conditions. So here you can see that you have to solve this equation BX equal to D subject to all these constraints. So you had the switching conditions here. You had the fact that the slack variable and the Lagrange multiplier are greater than equal to zero. That is for the constraints of the inequality type. You also had the fact that this xi i is greater than or equal to zero. It's a slack variable. And then we had split the Lagrange multiplier for equality constraint into two parts and therefore both these are also greater than or equal to zero. So essentially this is a whole set of equations or conditions. So some are equations, some are expressions and these need to be all solved to get a point which satisfies the KKT condition for the QP problem. So now we are going to simplify this second part by realizing that all these different variables such as the U, the S, the Xi, the Y, the Z are also parts of this X vector. And once you realize that you can write this in a very compact form, so the solution of the QP would be a matrix equation BX equal to D subject to this kind of a switching condition and subject to the positivity requirement on a large number of the design variables or on all the design variables. So this switching condition is uh, of course uh, nonlinear, but if you treat it as a switching condition, then it is possible to use it as usual in terms of the KKT type of method to get the solution to this problem. So in my book, as well as in different books, you will find some examples which illustrate solutions of typical problem using this method. It looks somewhat abstract, but you can get the feel for it here. Now, essentially this problem can be solved using the two phase uh, simplex method. And if you do that, then you can write a computer program to essentially solve the QP problem. So like I mentioned, because of the presence of the switching condition, this problem becomes nonlinear. But this problem can be solved using the two phase simplex method if H is positive definite. So once again, like mentioned before in the simplex method slides, you convert this problem into this form so as to get the starting solution. So you add the AV vector Y here, where this is the dimension of the Y vector that is N plus M plus P into one. So this is a vector we have put in to let us use the two phase simplex method. Now here X, I are non-basic and the Y, J are basic and all the D, I are greater than or equal to zero. The next fact is that we use these AVs to define the artificial cost function. And that is given by I is one to N plus M plus P, which is the size of this Y vector into YI. And here, of course, we are expressing this in terms of the basic variables Y. Now in the next stage, if you recall from the simplex method, we express these uh, cost function in terms of the non-basic variables. So this was the cost function W, and now you have this equation Bx plus Y equal to D, and so I can write Y as D minus Bx. Take that and substitute it here, I get this here. So essentially I substitute Y is D minus Bx into this equation, so I get D minus Bx here all the summations being present there. Now, this particular equation can be written in a more compact form. So we take the first term and we write that as W0. So W0 is this summation term here. And the next term CJ, I can define CJ as essentially this sigma here, that is sigma 
i is 1 to n plus m plus p over b i j and so this particular value is c j and that's a reduced cost coefficient and then i take this thing and i put it into the next slide so here you can see that uh, this cj is basically the negative of sigma over bj so essentially if you have the matrix b you have to take the columns and you have to get this bij here and then you have the w0 here w0 is i is 1 to n plus m plus p over di so w0 is the starting value of the artificial cost function cj is the starting value of the relative cost coefficient obtained by putting the numbers which are there in the jth column of the matrix b and changing its sign so that's the sign change here and again the slackness condition which is present that is x i into x n plus m plus i equals zero essentially is a mathematical way of saying that both these numbers are not simultaneously basic or both these variables are not simultaneously basic and this is essentially enforced onto the problem so now we can write out the procedure for solving the quadratic programming problem so you define the matrix b recall that the matrix b contains all the information about the problem in terms of the cost function in terms of the constraints you define the vector D that contains all the right hand side information about the problem in terms of the coefficients which are on the right hand side of the cost function and constraint. Check that all these DI are greater than or equal to zero. Calculate the current value of the artificial cost function and relative cost coefficients and then complete phase one of the simplex method. So if this particular cost function W is non-zero and all relative cost coefficients are non-negative and no new pivot can be found, then your QP is uh, infeasible. And if of course all this has been solved, then you have a feasible QP and then you can get a feasible solution for this problem. So if the feasible solution has been found, then you use the definition of the vector uh, X to rename the values of the QP variable. So if you have X with you, you can extract all the variables X, the Lagrange multipliers and the slack variables here, and then you can continue with this method. Now, one of the interesting things about the QP is that it not only gives you the solution to the problem, but it also gives you the Lagrange multiplier. And therefore this method works out very well in conjunction with the Shanikni descent function which requires Lagrange multipliers to calculate the penalty parameter. And that is something which we will see in the constraint design, design method, where essentially the Lagrange multipliers are used to build up the penalty term of the Shanikni descent function. So that presents you a background on quadratic programming. And like I mentioned before, quadratic programming is a bedrock of a lot of nonlinear optimization problems and there are very well written computer programs which solve quadratic programming and you can use these programs to solve different problems of course you have to do some kind of sequential quadratic approximation of the nonlinear function and once you have done that you can very easily solve the different problems so i will terminate this video here and i will see you in my next video